All right, guys, if you're watching this video, then you have made it. We have reached our last chapter for this semester. It's chapter 15, and um, it's going to be dealing with the different pathways for the sensory nervous system and the voluntary muscle system and kind of comparing the two and how the messages get from the central nervous system down to where they will meet the peripheral nervous system. Okay, it's kind of a short PowerPoint. It's only 70 slides. I'm not exactly sure how I'm going to break it up. I'm just going to kind of feel it out as we go, okay? All right, so let's get started. So we're going to be looking at the sensory pathways for the general senses. And we'll talk about what is the difference between a general sense and a special sense. And then we're going to talk about the motor pathways only for skeletal muscles, so only voluntary muscle movement. So sensory pathways. In order to get information about the body to the brain, we have to pass the information through a series of neurons, a minimum of three neurons that get us from the receptor up to the central nervous system. So the receptor is the key. A receptor is a special cell or at least a cell process, usually on the dendritic end, that is able to respond to a particular stimulus. And so because it can respond to a particular stimulus, it can monitor, monitor a specific condition. Now, this could be from outside the body, like what you see or hear or feel on the surface of the skin. Or it could be from inside the body, such as the need to defecate or urinate or hunger. Now, what they both work the same way. Whenever the stimulus is applied, the receptor is going to generate an action potential our good old friend, and the action potential is what's going to be passed up from that neuron up through a series of neurons up to the central nervous system. So they belong to the afferent division of the nervous system. That means we're sending signals up. The efferent or efferent division is what the body's going to do in response to the information. It's what the brain or spinal cord decides to do about the situation and then the signal that it sends down. So it's going to send it down through another series of neurons, a different set of neurons, and then it's going to arrive at the effector, efferent effector. They go together. So the effectors are what can actually change something about the body. Move a muscle, increase a heart rate, cause a gland to squirt, something in response to what that original stimulus was coming in through the nervous system. So the somatic division is going to carry out motor commands that will control the effectors. And of course, they have to travel from motor centers in the brain, and then they're going to go along somatic motor pathways. So here's the sensory pathway and the motor pathway kind of combined. So if you start over here, we have a stimulus. It depolarizes the sensory receptor and causes an action potential. The action potential gets passed up to the central nervous system. And then the central nervous system can send motor signals either through the voluntary muscle pathway, that would be the somatic motor, or through the involuntary pathway, that would be the autonomic motor response. So receptors, let's kind of focus in on these. They are either entire cells or specialized dendritic neurons, dendritic endings on the neurons. And there's a difference between sensation and perception. So since the entire nervous system can only deal in electrical currents, action potentials, sensation is simply the pattern of action potentials arriving from a particular receptor into the central nervous system. So they can be mapped. And it will look at things like how fast are they coming, um, how close together are they coming, and that will give us information by which neuron receptor is stimulated, how fast, and how long the stimulation is continuing. To actually put any meaning to those little bits of electrical pulses is perception. Perception is when your brain is able to take that information and actually translate it into something useful. For example, if you put your hand on a hot stove, Okay, by the time that message gets all the way up to your brain, you've already moved your hand. We talked about that in the last chapter. But that information that's coming from sensory receptors in the skin and the type of neuron it is carried on will make its way up to the cortex and the cortex will interpret my skin is now burned and damaged and I'm feeling pain from damaged tissue. That is perception. Okay, so your general senses are spread out all over your body internally and externally in, you know in the skin and in the organs and they are going to describe your sensitivity to temperature, pain, touch, pressure, vibration and proprioception. 
I think we talked about proprioception, but in case you've forgotten, proprioception is understanding your body's position in three-dimensional space. And it's based on the amount of tension and the position of your muscles and joints. And you teach yourself proprioception throughout your life. Your special senses are smell, taste, sight, balance, and hearing, also known as olfaction, gustation, vision, equilibrium, and hearing. And they are only special because we take all of the receptors for that one particular sense and we cluster them into an organ. So the special senses are only special in that they have their own organ that houses all of the receptors for that particular sense. For sight, all of our sight receptors are in the eyeball. For taste, it's in the tongue and the mouth and around the palate. So they're kind of localized, unlike touch, which is all over your whole body. So we're not going to go into special senses in anatomy one, but that is exactly where we pick up in anatomy two. So we have the detection of a stimulus and the stimulus receptor relationship is very specific. That means a receptor can only respond to a particular kind of stimulus. And if the receptor is located, you know, outside of the cell or in the skin, it's going to have an area around it that the stimulus has to be applied to within proximity in order for it to respond. And that's called a receptive field. So that is the area of the body monitored by one receptor cell. The bigger a receptive field a receptor has, the less specifically it can map where the stimulus is happening. Okay, so if you think about your fingertip, you have many, many, many very tiny receptive fields and anything you touch with your fingertip, you can be very uh, particular about which part of your finger it's touching. If we were talking about the skin on your back, however, I could touch you in several places and you really couldn't determine exactly where the tip of the pointer is touching you. You can kind of get a general area, but the receptive fields in the skin in the back are much broader. So we just kind of lose that specificity. And then we have transduction. Transduction is when we take an arriving stimulus and change it from whatever kind of stimulus it was into an action potential so it can be passed up through neurons. Okay, so here's an example of receptive fields. Now, of course, you don't have them this far apart on your skin usually, and there usually aren't gaps. But look here, we have the, the purple field and we have the blue field. So if you were to touch the skin in any of this area, it would be this neuron's receptors that would respond, okay? And if you touched in this field, it would be this neuron's, and this is how we would send the action potential. And your brain has a map of these. So if this is where the signal comes from, your brain knows that this is where you are being touched. What happens in this diagram if we touch back here? Well, according to this super simple diagram, nothing happens because you would not have a receptor to pick it up. Obviously, that doesn't usually happen. Okay, so again, taste, hearing, equilibrium, and vision are provided by special receptor cells. So the whole cell is the receptor, and then it's going to talk to a sensory neuron. So in the cell receptor will start the action potential process, generate an action potential that passes to the sensory neuron, and then the sensory neuron will send that action potential to the brain. And the, we're going to use chemical synapses for this. So when this information arrives in the brain, well, again, it's only a matter of little electrical pulses, action potentials. So how do we interpret it? Well, it's going to reach the cortical neurons. Remember, those are the ones in the cortex, the higher brain centers, through a particular path called a labeled line. And each labeled line will carry the information about one modality or type of stimulus. For example, pressure will come up one labeled line. Vibration will come up one labeled line. Light will come through a completely different labeled line. So where it's coming from, the path it's taking, already tells your brain something about what's going on. Then it's going to interpret the frequency and pattern of the action potentials to determine how strong is the stimulus, how long is the stimulus around, and is it changing. So your perception of the nature of a stimulus depends on how does it get to your brain, which path does it take. Now we also have this other process called adaptation. 
So there are going to be some stimuli that are around over and over or constantly. And we don't want to overwhelm our nervous system by having these action potentials always arriving at the cortex. Now we know that some of these are going to be filtered out by the thalamus, but we can actually start this filtering process all the way down at the receptor level. Okay, so we have peripheral adaptation at the receptor level out in the peripheral nervous system. And then we have central adaptation in the central nervous system. So if it's something like your clothing touching you, okay, your clothing hasn't gone anywhere. It's been touching you all day ever since you put it on this morning. So at some point we can shut it off at the receptor level. And then also we can use the thalamus to filter it out. So your nervous system is able to quickly adapt to any painless constant stimulus. Now we have two types of receptors based on whether or not they have the ability to adapt. Tonic receptors are always active and actually they do not adapt or show very little adaptation. Now which kinds of things do you want to be on these? Pain receptors. I know we all hate pain, but honestly guys, pain is a gift. The pain that's happening right now tells you that your body is either being damaged or is on the verge of being damaged. And then the memory of that pain reminds you not to perform the same behavior you did that got you the original pain. Think about that burning your hand on the stove. You're probably not reaching for hot pans very much, very often these days after burning yourself a few times. So we don't want pain receptors to adapt. We don't want to stop feeling the pain because pain causes our body to react and remove us from the stimulus, from the cause of the pain. So we would have our active receptors. If we started to be stimulated, it would be increased. And then if we remove the stimulus, it still is active. It's just not as frequent. Okay, so these are tonic receptors. Tonic means that they are going to stay the same. Phasic receptors are normally off. And so they're there to let you know about changing intensity or changing stimuli. These are very fast adapting receptors. So when something changes, they come on really strongly. But if it persists, they kind of fade away. And they won't come back on unless you get a new burst of activity. So here is our little graph. So they're normally off. We stimulate it. It comes on really, really high in the beginning. And then if the stimulus doesn't leave, it kind of fades off. And then if we change it, it'll come back on again. So here's a really good example of this. Your sense of smell. Now imagine we're back in our little lecture hall and before you guys got there, I went and got some Axe body spray and I sprayed a whole bunch of it in the room. So as you guys are walking in the room to take your seats, you're like, oh my gosh, what is that horrible smell, right? And you're just overwhelmed with the smell. And as I sit there and lecture for a little while, you don't smell it anymore. But then all of a sudden you say, okay, I need to use the restroom and you get up and leave the room. When you walk back into the room again, guess what? that same wall of smell will hit you just as hard as it did the first time. You had only adapted to it while you had sat there. Okay, so things like smell are very quickly adapting. So we can classify our sensory receptors another way, either phasic or tonic based on their adaptation, or we can classify them by where is the stimulus being applied. So an exteroreceptor is going to give you information about your external environment. So it's going to have to do with this, you know, things coming in from the outside. Proprioceptors are going to tell you your position of muscles and joints. And interoceptors are going to look at your visceral organs. So that's again, hunger, need to urinate, need to defecate. Your general sensory receptors can also be divided by what kind of stimulus is activating them. Okay, so nociceptors are our receptors for pain. Thermoreceptors, you see thermo like thermometer, are temperature receptors. Mechanoreceptors are when you physically distort something like you twist it or you bend it. And chemoreceptors are looking for particular concentrations of chemicals or ions. Think your oxygen levels, your blood glucose levels, your pH, things like that. Those are going to be chemoreceptors. So let's start with the first one, nociceptors. These are for pain, and they're usually free nerve endings that have big receptive fields, and you have them in all of your skin, you have them in your joint capsule, you have them in your bone coverings, you have them in the walls of blood vessels. 
Okay, so you can think those are all the different areas your body may become damaged. You also have them in some of your organs. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. Now, these are there for tissue damage. They are there for chemical problems, like as cells are being injured, they release chemicals which actually stimulate pain. And you notice I skipped over the top one, temperature extremes. Temperature extremes are red in your body as pain. Now, we've probably all burned ourselves. And we know that that feeling of pain, but let me, let me tell you another story. So I'm one of the few probably rare people in the room, if we were all together, who's actually frozen herself. So when I was working as a, a graduate student, we had these big freezers at, that were kept at minus 80 degrees Celsius. And we kept our samples in them in metal trays. And I always wore gloves, but this one day, my glove separated from the sleeve of my lab coat and I accidentally stuck my wrist to one of those metal trays that was at minus 80 degrees Celsius. And obviously, it froze to the metal and I had to pull my hand off. Now, what was my brain being told at that moment? It was being told that I was burning. It was the pain associated with an extreme temperature due to tissue damage. But because your body has more experience with heat than with cold, then anything that comes across as an extreme temperature is painful and as red as burning, okay? We're gonna see that pattern a lot. Once your brain starts to establish patterns, it will go for what it has experienced most often as the probable cause. There's a, this expression that when you hear hoofbeats, you should think horses and not zebras, right? Even though it might be a zebra, it's more likely to be a horse. That's kind of what your brain does with everything. It observes patterns and then it chooses the most likely source of that information. So pain, since it is a critically important signal, if it is impending tissue damage or actual tissue damage happening right now, it is going to be carried on your fastest type of neuron fibers, which are myelinated type A's. Remember, they're the big fat ones with lots of myelin. And that's going to be called fast pain. These are the ones that make you pull your hand away in a reflex. Okay, so they're going to go through the primary somatosensory cortex in the postcentral gyrus. And they're going to get conscious attention from your brain right away. And you can always pinpoint exactly where the pain is coming from if it is fast pain. But have you ever just kind of woken up and been kind of, well, I just don't feel good. Everything hurts. I'm kind of achy. That's another kind of pain. That's called slow pain. And it's carried on those tiny unmyelinated fibers known as type C's. So like, you know, your entire shoulder hurts, but you can't exactly put your finger on where the pain is coming from. It's the burny, aching kind of pain. So a different kind of pain. from it. It's not an impending injury. It might be a leftover injury. It's the after effects. Thermoreceptors are looking at temperature. Now, I have some good news and bad news. You're not a thermometer. You can't just pull your finger in the air and say, oh, it's about 73 degrees in here. All these temperature receptors can do is compare where they are now temperature-wise to where they just were. And where do we have these? They're free nerve endings, just like the pain receptors. And we find them in the skin and the dermis, in skeletal muscles, in liver and hypothalamus. Now, right now, I want you, wherever you're sitting, you know your body's about 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. You're probably sitting in a room that's somewhere between 72 and 76 degrees, if you're in the air conditioning. I want you to take your hand and touch any surface in your room. Okay, as soon as your hand touches the surface, that surface should feel cold to you. Because why? Because the skin on your hand is 98.6. Those receptors are sitting at 98.6. When you touch something that's in the 70s, it feels cold. Okay, so that's all we can do. If you really want to mess your brain up, try this one. Since you're home, you might do it just for fun. Take three bowls. In the first bowl, put some ice water. In the second bowl, a very bigger bowl, put lukewarm water. And in a third bowl, put really hot water, not hot enough to damage you. Put one hand in the ice water, put the other hand in the hot water, count to 30, and then take them both and stick them in the lukewarm water at the same time. The hand that was in the ice water will call the lukewarm water burning hot. The hand that was in the hot water will call the lukewarm water ice cold. And your brain gets very confused because those thermoreceptors are just comparing where they were to where they are now. 
Now, these sensations are conducted along the same pathways as pain. So they're going to go to the reticular formation, to the thalamus, and then to the primary somatosensory cortex. Mechanoreceptors are anything that twists or pulls or shoves a lever. Stretching, compressing, or twisting opens ion channels. So that lets you know when you're giving yourself an, a rope burn. Remember those guys? Okay. We have three kinds of mechanoreceptors. We have tactile receptors, baroreceptors, and proprioceptors. Tactile means touch. So they're going to think, do things that have to do with physically distorting the receptor with a certain kind of touch, like pressure, shape or texture, or vibration. Okay, three types of tactile receptors, touch, pressure, vibration. Baroreceptor, if you think it's like a barometer, is looking at pressures. Can be air pressure, can be blood pressure, can be just squeezing pressure, okay? They're going to be looking at changes in blood vessels, in your lungs, all types of places. And then proprioceptors that we've mentioned have been are in your joint capsules, your tendons, and your skeletal muscles, looking at the degree of stretch and the position of your body. So in the tactile receptor category, we have fine touch and pressure receptors that are very sensitive have tiny receptive fields and give us our detailed information about what is causing the stimulation. We also have crude touch and pressure receptors, which have bigger receptive fields, don't really give us the ability to pinpoint where it's coming from, and don't really tell us much about the stimulus other than it's deep or it's a strong pressure. So we're gonna go over these types of tactile receptors, six types of tactile receptors that are located in your skin, okay? So free nerve endings. We've already had two types of stimuli that travel on free nerve endings, pain and temperature. They are sensitive to touch also. They are between the epidermal cells and they are tonic receptors, which means they do not adapt with small receptive fields for touch sensations. So here is a image of free nerve endings. Touch, pain, pressure, and temperature all travel on these free nerve endings. It can all stimulate them. Now, in your skin, you also have those little tiny hairs. Well, around the base of each hair is a nerve ending called a root hair plexus. And if that hair moves, that root hair plexus becomes stimulated. So if you go outside and there's a breeze and they're all blowing around, oh, it feels really nice. If you're sitting in a room and a few of them start to wiggle, then you're screaming because there's a spider on your arm. Okay, there's the root hair plexus. Next, we have tactile discs, also known as Merkel discs. I will use Merkel disc because everything else is tactile. We're using it too much, okay? This is for fine touch and pressure receptors. They are also going to be able to tell you about the shape and texture of something. They are extremely sensitive and have tiny receptive fields. They're actually located up in the epidermis. Okay, so here is what they're calling the tactile disc, and it's also called a Merkel cell and the, with the nerve terminal. So they're up in the epidermis, very sensitive touch receptors. Okay, so we've had free nerve endings, we've had the root hair plexus, and we've had tactile or Merkel cells, Merkel discs. Next, we have bulbous corpuscles. I will call these by their other name, Ruffini corpuscles or Ruffini end organ. They're all the same thing. Now, these are looking for distortion or pressure deep in the skin. And it's a tonic receptor that shows little adaptation. So if someone grabs your arm, it's going to activate these receptors. And here's what they look like. They look like raw nerve endings, right? Free nerve endings, but wrapped up with some collagen fibers. Then we get to Paxinian corpuscles. Okay, Paxinian corpuscles are deep in the dermis. They are sensitive to deep pressure, but they're fast adapting. They're most sensitive to pulsing or high frequency vibrating, and a single dendrite lies within a series of concentric layers of collagen fibers. They are very big. They're located deep in the dermis. So here is a lamellar corpuscle or Paxinian corpuscle. And the last one are like the 
coccidian corpuscles, but they're much smaller, and they're up at the top of the papillary layer of the dermis, where the dermis and the epidermis meet. And these are called Meissner's corpuscles. They are for fine touch, little bits of pressure, and low frequency vibrations, but they adapt within a second. And you have a lot of these in your eyelids, lips, fingertips, nipples, and genitalia. So those are our six types of sensory receptors. There's what a Meissner's corpuscle looks like. Okay, baroreceptors, again, are looking at pressure changes. We're going to see a lot of these in anatomy too. Just introducing the concept right now. There's some places where we would find baroreceptors like looking for blood pressure in the carotid sinus and aortic sinus and in the lung and in your digestive tract and things like that. Proprioception are receptors found in joints, tendons, ligaments, and muscles and let you know what the position is. You do not have proprioceptors in your visceral organs, which is why you can't feel right now, where is my spleen? Where is my stomach? The three major kinds of receptors in the proprioceptors are muscle spindles, Golgi tendon organs, and joint capsule receptors. You just have to know general information about these. Okay, chemoreceptors. Again, we're looking at particular concentrations of individual molecules of, could be gases, could be uh, ions. So this is what tells us what our sodium concentration is, what our oxygen levels are, glucose, pH, all those things. And we have a lot of these in the carotid bodies and in the aortic bodies to monitor your blood. So here's some of those. Okay, so I'm going to stop this particular um, PowerPoint now, or uh, uh, recording right now on slide 46 because we're going to change topics, and then we'll pick up and we'll do 46 to 70 in the very last recording of the semester. Woohoo!